chatting to us here on Morning Live. So the poisoned chalice. I mean, I'm sure it's the one job that absolutely every young boy that goes into coaching wants to actually get to. But you say it really doesn't live up to that. Morning, Valen. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on. Yes, it's, uh, you know, as, as you said, I, I've been covering the, the beat for 22 years, so I've got to know a lot of the coaches very well, and I've covered them, uh, their careers very closely, and I think I was quite critical of, of some of them when they were in the job. But I resolved to go out and, uh, and, and do a book on uh, the, the Springbok coaching story, if you like, from 1992 onwards, just because I think that in this country, in rugby in particular, um, there's just so much pressure on the coaches. There's just so many uh, other factors that come into play that maybe uh, coaches in, in, in other countries don't experience. I'm talking about the passion with which we regard the game here. It's almost like a religion amongst some of the, of the South African population. And then, of course, the, the political background as well. So it was, uh, it was, it was a very uh, an enjoyable book to do. And what was also really nice was that you actually got the individual stories of each of the coaches post-isolation. Which of the stories most touched you? I know you have a special place with Peter de Villiers having partnered with him on his own autobiography. But I mean, which of the stories really kind of came out to highlight exactly what it takes to be a Springbok coach? Well, well, funnily enough, the very first one, John Williams, I, I was worried that I might not get to speak to him because he's living out in a very remote part of South Africa, out uh, about uh, 80 k's from all days, which is uh, out in the Limpopo province, very close to the Botswana border. And I didn't know if I was going to get a chance to, to speak to him uh, because he's very much, it's almost like a sort of reclusive com community out there. But in the end, I did speak to him and I was very pleased I did because, you know, having been on that very first Springbok tour uh, of the post-isolation in November or October of 19. 92 when they went to France and England. Um, I, among a lot of people, was critical of John Williams, the way he, he, he managed and, and coached the team. But, you know, the, the problems that he had to put up with, because South Africa came back from... Uh, well, a long period of, of isolation and, and they played against New Zealand and Australia in consecutive weeks. That was just to come back. And, and John Williams was, was given the job. First of all, he didn't even know he'd been given the job. He had to hear that uh, through secondhand information. He didn't believe it at first. He said, surely somebody would have told me if I'd been given the job. In the end, he made a phone call to, to what those days was the South African Rugby Football Union offices in Cape Town and said, listen, I believe I'm the Springbok coach. And the person he spoke to said, listen, I'll check for you. And indeed, it was correct. He was the coach. <laughs> then he thought thought he was going to have uh, you know, a chance to prepare the team and he was told no, you can only have the team three days before the match because sure. uh, the Curry Cup uh, um, presidents want to have their, their, their guys playing Curry Cup rugby up until then. So you know, it was a very, very difficult situation for him. What would you say is the common thread amongst all of these coaches besides the fact of course you say that all the pressure at some point they kind of lose a little, a little bit? Uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, well, I, I think most of them lost it to, to some extent. Uh, I think uh, Kitch Christie, who went through un, un, unbeaten, uh, some would say didn't, but uh, he also made some pretty strange decisions during his time. They eventually worked out for him, but playing Mark Andrews at number eight uh, in the World Cup semi final and, and quarter final in '95 was certainly not uh, completely sane, let's say. Uh, the common thread uh, through all of them was, that, was, was just the the, the pressures that they had to work under. Nick Mallett started off with a 17-run unbeaten streak. He thought it was plain sailing. But the minute you lose a game in South Africa, you're under pressure. And it doesn't matter what your record was before that. Nick Mallett had gone 17 matches unbeaten, as I say. Then the minute he lost against England, suddenly the pressure was there and, and the media pressure was there. Even the political pressure then started uh, following on from that. So I think that the common thread through for, for all of them was, was just the, the, the massive pressure that they had to, to put up with and I think Ian McIntosh summed it up near the start of the book where he said nobody will really understand the pressure that you work on when you've got this job until you actually have it. It's just a, a very unique pressure that uh, only those people who, who are in the job experience. I think following on from Peter de Villiers and the kind of figure that he was in the uh, South African spotlight and coming to Henneke Meyer, would you say Henneke Meyer is kind of getting it right and in dealing with the pressure? Well, I think that uh, I think pressure, uh, Hany Kamea feels the pressure. I think that Hany Kamea feel, feels the pressure possibly uh, as much, if not more, than any of the other coaches. And uh, he spends a lot of time dealing with that pressure. And, and, and you know, he's, he's got a very good relationship with the media as a result. But uh, I, I think that Hany Kamea has come in at a time when South African rugby is starting to mature in, 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 the, in terms of the 
um, assistance that's being offered the coaches with the coaches, the structures that are being put in place. I think that a lot of the previous coaches operated in isolation. They felt that they were very much sort of man alone against the rest of the South African nation, if you like. Uh, there are structures. Uh, Russia Erasmus with, is, is working as, as the sort of director of rugby or the performance director, uh, putting structures in place, not just for Hane Kamea, but, but also for the people who, who work in the under-20 team, uh, Davi Taron, uh, the Sevens coaches. I think that the support structures that are coming into place now that should make the job of the, the Springbok coaches going forward a lot easier. But that doesn't mean that there's not pressure. I mean, the media will continue to apply pressure. There's huge expectation from the public, and it doesn't matter what support base you've got. The minute your team starts losing, uh, the public expect you to win every game. The minute you start losing, then that pressure comes on. So we'll see, because uh, at, so far, Hane Kamea has a fairly good record. He hasn't lost too many games. And also, he's going to be put under the spotlight once again this year because, of course, it's the year before World Cup year. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, looking back, uh, the, 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 the second last year before the World Cup has often been a bad year. Uh, Jake White will tell you 2006 was a particularly poor year for him. And, and going back, if you look through history, um, often this particular year, because it's the third year in a cycle and, and this is when injuries start to, to pl play a role and, and, and this is when your depth might sort of be particularly tested. This can be a very testing year, if I can put it like that. So, so it, it, it could be a difficult one for Haneke, but I think that um, he's built up enough depth to be able to, to withstand the, the obstacles, that, uh, to overcome the obstacles that, that lie in his path. All right, lovely stuff, Gavin Rich. Thank you very much. He's the author of The Poison Chalice, has been following the Springbok team and covering them as a journalist for the last 22 years. Fantastic insights and also a great read. That's how we conclude.